Hi everybody, if you've got to this video then you're pretty close to finishing the Monarch application. There's not that much to go, but I want to take a brief interlude from developing the application itself to have a look at all of the different ways in which we can load and save data in Java. So there are all sorts of different approaches to loading and saving data and the one that you choose is going to depend upon the needs of the user um, and the type of application that you're building. But what I've done is created a new project here called Save Demo and then I've created a main class and I'm just going to go through and demonstrate some of the different approaches that you might consider. So the first step whenever you're going to load or save data is to decide where that file is going to be and we're going to look at different ways in which you can load and save from the user's hard disk. So um, in most cases if you're saving data you might want to ask the user where they want the file to be placed and there is a really easy way to do that in Java. There's something called a jfile chooser. So you can just write that as jfile chooser uh, chooser equals new jfile chooser. Now this is a swing component so it will work inside any program which uses swing. Okay, now um, what we do is get an option, so chooser.show open dialog. Um, now it will ask you for a parent and if you're running this from a Swing application then the parent should be whichever window um, you are using in your application. But if you don't have a parent you can just put null and the file requester window is going to open. Um, at some random place, probably in the middle of the screen, but I don't know exactly how it decides where the file request goes. Okay, so then um, what this does is this will show an option to choose a file. So let's just have a look at that first of all. I'm going to save it and run it. And when we run it, we can see that we get um, basically a standard file selector like this. I can just click on somewhere just going into a random folder here. Okay, and then once, once I've chosen a file, then the program ends. Now, um, obviously we want to do something with that file, so what you have to do is write an if statement to check what the user decided to do. Um, now that's because the user won't necessarily choose a file, they might choose cancel. So um, there are actually lots of different options for what the user can do. They might choose cancel. Um, there's also some other options here. Not all of these are things that the user can do, but they're things that you can select. For example, if you only want to show directories or you only want to show files in the file selector. But what we're looking for is this approve option. So this basically means if the user selected a file and said that they wanted to load it. And if they did, then we can get the name of the file. Uh, I think it's get name. No, it's not. Get selected file. There we go. Okay, now that actually returns a file, so let's change it. An import file. And then we'll just print that file out. Okay, so if I run it now, um, again, the file chooser pops up. I can click on just some random thing. So here I'm selecting this file, jshint.js. And then if I select it, you can see that it provides a path for that file. So this is saying it's on the C drive. It's in the folder users, Lewis documents, processing modes, p5js mode, jshint.js. Um, if I run the program again, and this time let's say that I click on cancel. So I still select the file but then I click on cancel and you can see it does nothing and that's because my option would have been cancel instead of approve there. Um, so um, you should make sure that you check that the user does press the open button or select a file before you do anything with the file. Okay, so that's one way um, in order to get the user to select a file for loading or saving data. Um, now, another option might be that you 
choose the file location for the user. And that can be appropriate depending upon what it is that you want in your application. So for example, if your application is saving configuration data, you probably don't want the user to have to choose where that configuration data gets saved, right? You just want to save it automatically and then have it uh, restore the previous configuration the next time the user starts the program. On the other hand, obviously, if you wanted the user to be able to save data so that they could put it in an email or something like that, well, then you probably do want to give them the option to choose where to save it to. So let's say that we didn't want the uh, user to have to choose the location. Um, let's say that we wanted to load it automatically. One of the most useful things you can do here, and I'm just going to comment out that part that we had earlier so that it's not part of our program. Okay, so one of the most useful um, tricks is that you can get the user's home directory. Now, the way you do that is by writing string home equals system dot get property and then in quotation marks user dot home. Now, let's just print that out. And we can see that this tells tells us where the user's home directory is. Now their home directory is not necessarily the same as their documents folder um, and uh, particularly on Windows it to be honest is a bit of a mess. Um, they uh, Microsoft have changed it quite a few times. They had document no they had my documents and then it was documents and and basically it's just characteristic Microsoft behavior. Um, but anyway um, but the important thing is that wherever the home directory is, um, that is a good place for you to save configuration data. So if we were just saving information like the user settings, um, then I certainly wouldn't ask the user where to, to set where to save that uh, because that's normally going to be a nuisance for them. It's normally much better just to automatically save it in their home directory somewhere. Uh, now you might notice that when we um, got a directory location here, we got that directory location as a string, right, as text. But when we asked the user to choose a file, we got that directory as a file. Um, so a file refers to a particular file location on the hard disk. It actually doesn't have to be an existing file. It could be a location where you're going to create a new file. Um, and uh, a file is able to do things which are specific to um, the uh, file system. So you can use the file class to do things like creating folders um, and stuff like that. Obviously, a string is just a piece of text. So if I wanted to get a file from that string, it's pretty easy. You can write file, uh, let's put home file equals new file, and then just put the uh, name of the string in the brackets um, and then that will create a file from the text. And then to give an example of why you would want to convert that text into a file, uh, well if I type home file dot and then you can see that I've got lots of suggestions of things which I can do with files. So for example I can delete files, um, I can uh, create files, um, and all sorts of things which if it was just text I wouldn't be able to do that. Okay now as well as uh, files um, there's also something called a path um, and they do overlap in functionality quite a bit so um, the reason that there are two different um, but similar classes file and path is basically because file is the older version um, I think that was introduced in the original version of Java, so probably from the very beginning Java had file, um, whereas path is a probably better designed version um, which was introduced in later versions of Java. I'm not sure when, I think maybe Java 9, but I'm not 100% sure about that. Um, so in some of the later examples we'll have a look at using path as well, but um, if you're a little bit confused about why sometimes use sometimes use file and sometimes use path, it's basically just a question of whether we're using the older method or whether we're using a newer method of loading and saving data. 
OK, so those are two different ways in which you might decide where to save a file. Now let's actually try and save some data in a file. So what I'm going to do is get the user's home directory. Then I'm going to create a file inside the home directory. And then I'm going to write some text into that file. Now I'm actually going to use the path method here. Um, so I'll put path and then save path because this is going to be the path where I save my data equals paths with an s dot get um, and then I write uh, home in brackets now that's going to get the path to my home directory so actually let's call that home path and I'll just import path as well now what I want to do is create a folder inside my home directory where I'll save the data. So this is what's going to be called save path. And this is home path dot resolve. And then I write the file name of the file inside that directory. So let's call it test save dot txt because we're just going to save some text in there. So what this means is that we're going to the home folder and then the word resolve basically means to uh, create a path to a file inside that folder. OK, so um, test save.txt is a path inside my home folder. But the file doesn't actually exist yet. This is just kind of like pointing to a location where the file is going to be created. So now let's create a string. And now what I'm going to do is to write that string into the save path. So I can do that with files.writeString. Now, where do I want to save it? I want to put it in save path. So that's the first thing. What do I want to save? Text. So that comes from there. Um, now, the third is an option. And um, I'm just trying to remember where I get the options from. Maybe it's in the files class. Uh, no, it's not. Uh, file options, maybe it's called. File options dot. File option dot. I should have researched this before I did the video. Um, okay, let's just do a bit of a bit of a check. So I'm going to search for Java files. Go to the Oracle documentation. I'm looking for write string. Uh, that will do. Um, and where do the options come from? Open option. OK, um, so maybe it's in open option. Dot. No, hold on. That's not right. Uh, standard open option. Standard open option dot. OK, here we go. Create. So I want to create a new file. Create new. I'm not sure how they're different, but I'm just going to pick create for now. OK, so um, this is going to write the text into that file that I pointed to before. And you can see that it's underlined in red because, as we already know, um, Eclipse is saying what? What do you want to do if something goes wrong with saving this file, right? Because writing to a file system is not guaranteed to succeed. There are all sorts of problems that could occur. Now, generally, what we want to do is choose surround with try and catch. And then this suggestion, which Eclipse gives of e.printStackTrace, I don't like that suggestion. I think a better thing to do is to write throw new runtime exception and then E in brackets. So basically, that just means that if an error occurs, then crash the program. <laughs> um, now, there, there may be times uh, later on when you want to deal with the error in a more elegant way. But a lot of the time, this is the if you're sure that the error isn't going to occur, then this is a simple way to deal with it. OK, so let's give this a test. I'll run the program. We don't see any message here. Um, but the proof of whether it's worked or not is when I go to my home directory. So that was c colon backslash users 
Lewis. And when I go to my home directory, you can see there is the file, testsafe.txt. If I double click on it, then it does contain um, that text that I wanted to save. So that shows us how to save a little bit of text. Now we can read it back in as well. So let's have a look at that. I'll put string text to equals files dot read string. And then I'm going to read in the, the string from the same path. Now again, um, it could go wrong. OK, so Eclipse is saying, what do you want to do um, if it goes wrong? And what I'm actually going to do is put this into the same try part, the tr same what's called a block. Uh, so a block means anything between those curly brackets. So I'm going to put it inside the same block as the original write string because basically I want to deal with errors in the same way. So now if I print that out, the saved data was plus text to. So this is going to print out the data that I read in from the file. And of course, that should be the same as what we saved there. So let's just test it. And that's correct. So that gives you the first method of saving data, which is basically you can save a single string of text. Um, now, saving a string of text is very simple, but it's also quite limited uh, because most of the time your data is going to have some kind of structure to it. Um, so you might, for example, have a mix of numbers, um, some text, uh, maybe some other types of variables, some classes, um, and uh, all of those different things. Um, obviously, they need to be represented in some way. Um, so this method of writing data by just writing a string um, is something to only use if uh, it's a very simple situation or if you want to provide some kind of export functionality. So sometimes in a program, you might want to have a way to export the data uh, so that the user can keep a backup or something like that. And maybe the user wants to have that in a format that they can read in a normal text editor. So this could also be a case where you might want to use this approach. OK, but let's move on and let's have a look at another method of loading, loading and saving data. Um, so. Uh, the second method um, is going to be uh, using Java's built-in serialization. Um, so I'm going to create a new object here. Um, and let's call this demo object. Um, and inside demo object, I'm going to create a couple of uh, items. So let's have an integer. We'll call this x. And we'll have a string. We'll call it name. Now I'm going to create a constructor. OK, and you can see that this is basically um, just an example of an object. Um, this has no particular purpose, uh, no particular meaning, but it's just an example of loading and saving data. So let's say that I make an object like that. So demo object, demo object equals new demo object. And I'll give it a number, one, two, three, four, and a name, uh, Mr. Foo. OK, there we go. Um, now, if I wanted to save that object to a file, um, then there is a way uh, to save the object, which is actually built into Java. What you do is, uh, after your object, you write implements serializable with a Z. And we just import that. OK, now to write that object, um, we need to create something called an object writer. Um, so first of all, we have to create an output stream. So output stream, stream equals new file output stream. Um, and I'm going to provide uh, the path which I used before. So save path. Now, file output stream is actually an old way of saving files. So this needs a file rather than a path. Fortunately, there's an easy way to um, 
to convert a path to a file, all you do is you write dot to file at the end, um, and then that will work. Now, um, it's underlining because again, it wants me to do the try catch stuff, so I'll just do that the same as I did before. Okay, now this makes an output stream, which is basically um, a place for me to send data and that data is going to be written to the file in this case. Now lots of the ways that we save data to a file are going to be using that output stream. So um, this is a common pattern that you're going to see again and again. Um, and you can have output streams which go to other places. So you could have an output stream maybe going to like a network socket uh, to send data over the internet um, or um, an output stream going to uh, I don't know, maybe an archive file or something. I don't know where else you could connect an output stream to, but the, the basic idea is that it's somewhere you can send data in order for it to be uh, transmitted or stored. So once I've made the output stream, um, now I need to create an object writer. So I'll put object writer, writer equals new, object writer stream. Now, I hope I've remembered the name of that class correctly. Ah, no, I haven't. Right, hold on a second. This is something else I should have researched before the video, but never mind. It's the high production values that make you keep coming back to the channel. Um, so, is it object output instead of object writer? object output stream. Okay, there we go. So object output stream O stream. Let's call it O stream equals new object output stream. Okay, and um, it's complaining here because I've only dealt with one possible error, which was file not found, but I can change it to deal with all sorts of input output errors by just changing that to IO exception instead of file not found exception. Okay, so now what I can do is I can just put O stream dot write and then provide my demo object. Uh, should it be right object? Hold on, that's not quite right. O stream dot right object. There we go. Right object demo object. Okay. Um, now I've still called it test save dot text, but I shouldn't call it dot txt because this isn't going to be a a text file. This is going to be uh, raw data, so I'll call it test save dot raw. Uh, now, if I run the program and have a look in my home directory again, we can see the test save dot raw. Now, if I try to open that with a text editor, I'm just going to see a whole bunch of junk, so I'm not going to uh, try to do that. Um, but it is in fact a Java serialization of the object. So basically Java has converted all of the data for that object into some binary and then it's saved it to the folder. Um, so we can read it in again. Let's do that as a demonstration. So I'll make a new demo object up here. Demo object, demo object 2. Okay, now I'll put equals null because at the beginning we don't have any demo object 2, but what I'm going to do is to read in this file as demo object 2. And to do that, we swap all of the outputs for inputs. So input stream is file input stream. Okay, so this time we're reading data from that file. And then we've got object input stream equals new object input stream. Okay, and then the last thing we do is we write demo object 2 equals, oh, now this is an input stream, so I should change the name to iStream instead of OStream. So iStream dot read object. Now, 
this reads an object and that object is not necessarily a demo object, right? Java has no way of knowing if that is actually going to be a demo object or it could be some other type of object. So what we have to do is in brackets write demo object, which basically amounts to us promising Java that this is going to be a demo object. Okay, um, now this can also create a class not found exception. So we have to basically deal with that exception as well here. So um, what that means is that it's being underlined in red because there's another thing that can go wrong. Okay, so uh, in this case, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, well, uh, there's two ways to deal with it. There's the correct way and there's the quick and easy way. So um, the quick and easy way is to delete the IO and that means it's going to catch every type of error. Um, however, um, that's not really the correct way and I think I better at least show you the correct way. So the correct way is to actually have a second catch like this and then we can do the same thing. Um, so, you may say, why is that better than uh, just deleting the I.O.? And the reason is that um, what what we're doing is we're saying to Java, if this error occurs, um, then you can just crash the program. If that error occurs, you can just crash the program. And we're giving permissions to Java to basically crash the program when certain errors occur. Now, if I delete the I.O., then I'm giving permission for Java to crash the program on any error. And that is not necessarily a good idea. Um, generally, you don't want to be too broad in the permissions that you give. Um, so that's that's a sort of simplified summary of what's going on there. But having said that, I think it's actually fine in most of your most of your work, unless you have a, a bigger plan for handling particular errors just doing that is probably going to be acceptable. I should say that try and catch are not on the syllabus. So although you do need to use them in your internal assessment, they won't come up in the exam. Um, but it's very hard to actually do a practical Java program without having to use them. OK, so this will read in demo2 object. And then um, lastly, let's just print that out. System.out.println demo object to and to make sure that we can actually see something let's add a to string method here so public string to string will return name plus x so um, in this case it should say mr foo one two three four if it works and there we are so mr foo one two three four so what that means is we save the object to a file then we loaded that object back in from the file and then we printed out that object and it had correctly saved the object that we wanted it to save. So um, this is also a quite a neat way of saving data um, with Java. It means that you have to put implement serializable on all of the classes that you want to be able to save. Um, but then you are able to save the data in a pretty simple way. Um, now, it isn't perfect. Uh, the This approach is actually, uh, I think, largely obsolete. Um, a lot of Java programmers have stopped using it now, I believe. Um, and there are some issues with it. But I just don't think that you're likely to hit those issues um, in the kinds of programs that you'll be creating for your internal assessment. So if you don't mind having a file format, which is not easy to um, look at yourself and debug, okay? One of the disadvantages of this method of saving files is that you can't really look at the data in your file. Um, you can load and save it, but if you try to open it in a text editor, you're not going to be able to see anything. So that is a big disadvantage. But apart from that, it is quite an easy way to load and save objects in Java. Um, and if you're happy with that, then this could be a good approach. Okay, so um, let's have a look at another approach now. Uh, this time we're going to have a look at using JSON to load and save data. Um, now, um, I'm going to use the uh, Jakarta JSON, uh, which was the library that we've already used um, in uh, the lesson that we did on get using Internet APIs. 
So you may already have a copy of it. If you haven't, I will provide the jar again. But I'm just going to copy and paste it from another project. So I'll copy it and paste it into my source folder. Now to make it available to my program, I have to right click on it, go to build path and choose add to build path so that it appears inside this referenced libraries. Okay, um, now once you've done that, we can use JSON um, and JSON can be a good way to save data. So um, let's go back to demo object and the way that I would normally use JSON uh, to load and save data is that I would create a, um, a a uh, routine to load and save from JSON. So first of all, I'd have public JSON object to JSON. And this is going to create a JSON object from the data inside demo object. So um, to do that, we create a JSON object builder. I'm just going to call it B to save a bit of typing rather than writing JSON object builder equals JSON dot create object builder. OK, now once you've made an object builder, you can add things into the builder. So B dot add. Um, now you give them a name and a value. So let's put name X and value is X, right? So the name obviously is in quotation marks. The value is a reference to that variable. So we're going to take that variable and we're going to store it with the name X. And then I'll do the same with name. And then once I've done that, I just return b.build. Now what that does is it's going to create a JSON object which has X and name in it. Now I write another routine called from JSON. Now from JSON is going to take a JSON object. Uh, let's just call it O. And I'm going to uh, create a new demo object. New demo object. And I need to get those values. So first of all, I need the value of x. Now x is going to be o.getInt, and it was called x. And name, string name equals o.getName, uh, sorry, get string, and that was called name. And then once I've got the values of x and name, I just create a new demo object from those values. Um, New demo object. What's gone wrong here? Uh, returns. Uh, oh, I've put JSON object. Sorry. What a doofus. Okay. Um, now, um, for reasons which we will see later on, I'm going to write the word static in front of this uh, method. So we haven't looked at static yet, but um, at the moment, I'm just going to say that you need to write static there. OK, so uh, what this means is that I can let's create a new demo object. Demo object. Demo object one equals new demo object. One, two, three, four. Mr. Foo. OK, now. I can convert that demo object into JSON text by just writing demo object one dot to JSON. And if I print that out, you can see that this is a JSON text data. OK, so the brackets mean that this is an object. Then I've got X and that is one, two, three, four. And I've got name and that is Mr. Foo. Now, if I want to create a new object from that, so demo object, demo object two equals. Now I write the name of the class demo object dot from JSON, and then I provide um, the JSON text which which I had before. So let's put that in a string. String text equals.
Uh, oh, sorry, it's not text, it's a JSON object. Okay, now if I print out demo object 2, and that will print out exactly the same object as I originally created, because what I've done is I've taken that object, I converted it into JSON data, then I created a new object from the JSON data, and of course the new object is identical to the old object. Now that JSON data, the JSON object there, um, I could save that to a file. Um, it's uh, I could do that just by writing the text to a file in the way that we saw earlier on. I don't know if there's any uh, method to um, create writer. Uh, I might examine that later on. Um, I think that uh, I might be able to. Let's just give this a try. File output stream. O oh, stream equals new file output stream. Save path dot to file. And then we're going to try JSON dot write uh, create writer. Uh, I have used this before. I just don't remember exactly how to use it. Ob demo object one. Um, sorry, create writer. O stream. Dot. Write. Yeah, that's right. Write up. Uh, I think I can just write. Um, demo object one. Okay, so it does need to be right object. And I guess... Oh, sorry, hold on. That should... Let's call that JSON object. JSON object. Okay, and now we should be able to read it in from the file. So, uh, file input stream i stream equals new file input stream save path dot to file and then um, I'll do json dot create reader i stream dot read object and I'm going to put that into um, my um, JSON object. Let's call that JSON object one. And this one JSON object two. Um, and then I can convert that JSON object two back to a demo object. Okay, and then lastly, of course, we have to surround this with try and catch. So because this is all file operations, they could go wrong. And we have to tell Java what to do if it all goes uh, if it all goes bad. So, so sorry about that, but um, this should work now. Okay, so what we've got at the end is we've created a demo object, okay, and then we've converted that demo object to a JSON object, and then we've created a file output stream where we can save that data to and then we have written the object to that output stream and then to test it we've created a file input stream from the file that we just saved and then we read that in as a JSON object and then we convert the JSON object into a demo object and then we print out the demo object and it should be the same as the object that we started with so it should say Mr. Foo one two three four and it does, okay? And if I go to my home folder, now of course I called it testsave.raw, let's change that to testsave.json because this is JSON data now, so let's play again. And there's my JSON file. Um, now, JSON obviously it is a little bit more work um, than using the serializable, but one of the advantages is that I can open up that JSON file 
uh, for example using Notepad, and I can see the data inside the JSON uh, file. Is something that you can open in a text editor and I can even for example experiment uh, by changing values here so let's say I want to change the name from Mr. Foo to Mr. Bar okay and maybe I want to change that number to 5678 now I can just save that back from my text editor now I better comment this part out because I don't want to save over the file I just want to read it in and then output the data. So let's test if this works. And there we go. Okay, so it means that it's something that you can open in a text editor, change the data, and that's a big advantage for debugging your program, um, for experimenting with your program. So the added work in creating um, the JSON uh, functions, things like to JSON and from JSON, yes, it is a little bit of extra effort, but I think that the payoff in terms of uh, debugging your program can be significant, right? So um, I am a big fan of JSON. I think it's a very useful data format. Um, and one of the things that makes it useful is that it isn't that complicated, but it is quite powerful. You can do a lot with it and it's just so easy to work with. Okay, um, now um, we're going to have a look at one more method of saving data um, and this is something called uh, JSON binding. So um, if it is a lot of effort for you to write these to JSON and from JSON for your project and this tends to happen if you have a very complicated project, right? A lot of the time I think that your projects are going to be simple enough that you could write these by hand and it probably is going to be a better result. But if you do have a very complicated project, you might be interested in using JSON bindings. So um, in order to use that, you're going to need some other libraries. I've got them here. One of them is the JSON binding API. I'm just going to copy and paste that. And again, I'll provide these for you um, in order for you to, oh, sorry, uh, in order for you to test these out. Oh, that's annoying. What, what's going on? It's trying to copy the text instead of copying the file. I think that's what's happening anyway. There we go. Okay. And now uh, the other uh, library you need is this library called Yason, uh, which is basically an implementation created by the Eclipse team. And then once I've put those libraries in, of course, I have to go to build path and add to build path. Okay. Um, now, once you've got those libraries added to your project, um, you can, instead of writing these by hand, instead of writing to JSON and from JSON, um, you can basically get uh, the Yason library to do it for you. Um, so, what we do need to do in this case is to have getter and setter methods. Um, now, you can create those getter and setter methods in Eclipse, which is what I'm going to do here by going to source and then create getters and setters or generate getters and setters, select all and generate. But um, those getter, writing getter and setter methods is very likely to come up on paper too. So I really recommend that you write them by hand. OK, don't be lazy like me and um, use Eclipse to auto generate them. So uh, here is the getter method, okay? And remember that uh, the proper name for a getter method is an accessor method, okay? And in this case, because x is an integer, the accessor method is called get x and it returns an integer. And then the uh, setter method, the proper name for that is a mutator method. So the mutator method is called set x and that copies the value of x into this class. Okay, so if you want to have data stored by Yasin, um, then you need to have a public getter and setter method for that data. Otherwise, it's not going to work. Okay, but of course, you can generate those automatically in Eclipse, but better still to write it by hand because you know that it's going to come up on paper too, almost certainly, almost certainly. 
Okay, so once we've got those getter and setter methods, um, we can uh, create JSON from the, that object um, using the JSON B uh, builder. So um, I'll put JSON B equals new JSON B builder, is it? I'm trying to remember what the class is called. No, nope, that doesn't exist. That does, though. Um, right, can I remember? Jakarta, Jason B. I know these videos obviously aren't super well researched beforehand. I'm just kind of like doing this off the top of my head and uh, that does mean that I have to look stuff up occasionally. Okay, so actually um, it did get the correct class name, but it's not with new. So JSON B builder dot create. Okay, now that creates a JSON B builder. Then all we do is B dot um, to JSON and then provide the name of the object. So in this case, oh, I don't have an object. Let's create a demo object again. Demo object one equals new demo object. One, two, three, four, Mr. Foo. So then to JSON, demo object one. And that will return a string. Okay, now I can print out that text. And run it. And you can see that it's basically done exactly the same as what we did by hand earlier on. Okay, it's converted that object into a string and it's done it automatically by looking at the public accessor and mutator methods which exist for the class. Now, if you wanted to go the other way, if you wanted to um, convert the JSON data back into an object, that's also pretty easy. So I've already got my JSON builder here, B. So what I do is demo object, demo object two equals B dot from JSON. Uh, now I provide the text and then I provide the type of object that I want to get out. So in this case, because I know that I want a demo object, I write demo object dot class. Okay, uh, now let's print out demo object two. And if it's worked correctly, then it should say one, two, three, four, Mr. Foo. Oh, no default constructor found. Okay, that's because I need to have a method here called public demo object. Um, and then um, actually I can just leave it blank to be honest. I don't need to put anything there, but I just need to make sure that it's public demo object. So um, this is for something called Java beans. Um, so um, basically Java beans are objects which have a constructor with no arguments. Okay, so this constructor isn't acceptable for Java beans because it requires an X and a name. So this is a constructor with no arguments and also we need to have public getter and setter methods or accessor and mutator methods to use the correct names. So the reason I got this error was because I didn't provide that constructor and it's saying, hey, uh, this is supposed to be a Java bean, so you need that constructor. So now if I try it again, there we go. And now we've got the correct answer, Mr. Foo, one, two, three, four. Um, so in this case, I converted the object into a string, but you can also convert it to a um, a file. So um, I'm just going to see if I can remember how to do that. Is there an easy way? Yeah, there is. So to JSON, uh, now uh, I'll put demo object, and then what I can do is provide an output stream. So let's make a file output stream. O stream equals new file output stream save path dot to file and then put O stream 
Okay, and then here uh, we're going to read it back in from an input stream. I better close that stream. So then file input stream, i stream equals new file input stream save path dot to file and then I want to read from that input stream and then I want to close the input stream and I want to print out the object that I wrote now again I because I'm dealing with files here I have to write the try and catch so this hopefully is all becoming second nature to you now okay um, so in this case what I did I created an, a file output stream then I used the JSON B um, or I created a JSON B builder and then I use that JSON B in order to write the demo object to the output stream. Then I close the output stream because um, if you're writing to a file, when you finished with it, you have to close the file so that other programs can read the file. Okay, you shouldn't really leave the file open. Um, if you do leave the file open, then it should be closed when your program exits. But it's a good way to have nasty errors um, if you just leave files open all the time. Okay, now once we've written that file, we create a file input stream so that we can read data from the file. And then we use the JSON builder that we created up here um, in order to read from that input stream and create a demo object from it. And I called that demo object 2. Then I close the file and then I print out demo object 2. And of course, if it's come in correctly, then I should get Mr. Foo 1, 2, 3, 4 again. And we do. Okay, so. Um, Again, if I go in here and look at testsave.json, there's the data. It's exactly the same as before. The difference is that we don't have to write by hand a to JSON and from JSON method. Um, all we need to do is make sure that we've got these getx and setx, blah, 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 get name, set name. Um, whether you think that this method is worth the compromises that you have to make, um, is up to you. Uh, some people like it because it's kind of, uh, in some ways it's kind of neat. Um, there are definitely advantages to it. One of the things that I like is that it forces you to write a um, accessor and mutator methods and that's something that you have to do on paper too. So I like the fact that if you use this this particular method then you're being forced to practice important material uh, for the exam as well. Um, but the disadvantage with this method is that you do lose a lot of flexibility. For example, you have to make sure that all of your objects um, com comply with the rules for Java Bean. So that means they need to have these constructors, they need to have all of the accessor and mutator methods. Um, and if you're not going to do that, then maybe it's better to use the handwritten method uh, by creating a to JSON and from JSON uh, method. Okay, so guys, we've looked at a lot in this lesson um, and I just want to finish by summarizing some of the things that you need to consider um, when you're looking at how to save data for your program and how to load data back in. Okay, so the first thing is um, think about where th uh, how you're going to specify the location of that data. Now, you might have some data where the user chooses where it gets stored and some data where it automatically goes into a particular location, right? So, for example, a lot of programs, they might have some configuration data and they might also export documents, right? Let's say you have a program which um, does billing for a company. Well, um, things like the user preferences, you know, the choice of... Um, uh, a particular text font or something like that, you don't need to ask the user where to store that data. That should probably be stored automatically in the user's home folder somewhere. But on the other hand, if you want to save a printout of the bill or something like that, well, in that case, you need to ask the user where to save it. Okay, so uh, the first thing is to think about that carefully and to make the right choices in terms of how you ask the user for file locations. 
Now, once you've decided where you're going to save data, you've got really, I would say, three choices, or at least that we've covered in this video, uh, three reasonable choices for the way that you save data. So the first option is just to save a text string. And that is very simple, but it's also obviously very limited. Um, it can still be a really good option if you know that the data um, you're saving is uh, very simple or maybe you don't need to read the data back in, right? So sometimes writing text, if you know that you're never going to have to read that data back in and it's just for human consumption, um, then writing text could be a good option. So it's a, it could be a really good way to export data um, for other purposes. Um, now the second option we had a look at was um, using uh, Java serializable. Okay, so this is an approach which is built into Java. That's a big advantage. And it works really well saving um, pretty much any type of Java class. The problems with serializable, although they are, um, although there are serious problems with it, I don't think that you're likely to encounter them in the types of projects that you'll be working on for the IB course. Um, so serializable has a lot of advantages. Um, one of the big disadvantages with Serializable is the fact that if you want to use that, um, your files are going to be saved as a as raw data. It's going to be difficult for you to actually look at those files or change those files by hand. Um, and that can sometimes be a problem for debugging. And then the third method we had a look at was with JSON, right? So loading and saving JSON data. And hopefully you're already a little bit familiar um, with using JSON um, from the stuff we did with uh, web website APIs. Um, so I think the things that recommend JSON um, are that it's an easy to read format. Uh, you can check that your program is actually saving the data you want it to by opening that file in a text editor and looking at the data that's been written out. You can even change the data inside that file by hand and then check that the new data is read back into your program correctly. The disadvantage with using JSON is that it does take a little bit more work. Um, either you need to write those to JSON and from JSON methods or you need to use these um, YASN and uh, JSON binding libraries. Um, and which of those you think is right for you uh, depends upon your approach to storing data. But both of them do include a little bit of extra overhead. In my opinion, it is worth it. Um, my preferred option for many, many projects would be to write the to JSON and from JSON methods by hand um, and save JSON data like that. Uh, but that's just my personal preference. Um, and I think that um, one of the things that uh, the examiner will be looking at when you write the criterion A for your internal assessment is that you can justify your choice of uh, approach. So um, whatever uh, technique we're talking about, not necessarily loading or saving data, but whatever uh, you're doing in your project, the choice that you make is less important than whether you have a good reason for making that choice and whether you can explain why you made that choice. So whatever option you're going to go for, um, you should have some explanation that you can give for why you decided to do it that way. OK, so um, guys, I hope that all makes sense. Obviously, there's so much in this lesson, but um, since it's uh, all on uh, video, you can uh, just come back to it when you're actually working on your projects if you need to load and save some data and skip through and hopefully find the parts that are relevant to what you want to do. Thanks very much and uh, in the next video we should be able to finish off the Monarch application by using one of these methods to load and save Monarch data.